in Thailand, so I'm very happy I did. My European Union delegations, ASEAN University. At present, Nama is taking the, the duties and responsibility also at the, Yeah, We are involved in the development of the education sector, mostly in the higher education. So networking and coordinating for the education developments and also promoting to the international collaboration, cooperation and also student mobility and also credit transfer system. The project has been doing a lot of uh, aspect of development in higher education. For example, uh, scholarship for student mobility and the quality assurance as well as involving high-level officials for the policy dialogue as well, which we think that this is a very good way of uh, connecting the region. One point or one question or one concern really over the next two years is uh, going to focus on building the sustainability of the different result um, strands so far. That means embedding the credit transfer system across the ASEAN region, building more and more opportunities for young people to access opportunities to travel across the region to build their understanding, but also to enhance their professional qualifications and, and further um, employment opportunities as a result. We not only get to experience um, studying our courses in another country, but then we also um, really grow as individuals culturally and um, working towards one another in um, consolidating or in identifying ourselves with ASEAN. QA, QF, I'm already quality assurance, frameworks. It was uh, amazing for me uh, to spend the last four years working on this program. And now the program will be uh, extended. I hope the result will be exactly what people are expecting for. The mobility seem at least to really have that mainstreamed and aligned within ASEAN still. Uh, activity yesterday afternoon and it's the opportunity for each. Over the last day and a half we've worked very hard with ASEAN member states, um, institutions and other stakeholders um, to try and develop a vision for um, share of and how share can support over the next two year extension. It's been very positive and we look forward to getting some really strong outcomes from this meeting that will help us to deliver and support the development of this higher education space um, in the next two years. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, very pleased to welcome you all to the 11th policy dialogue of the EU uh, ASEAN Share Program. Um, this is a new uh, sort of webinar series that we're introducing in place of our uh, you know, previous 10 uh, policy dialogues, which have been in person. So we're trying a new format and we hope works for you uh, joining us and joining us from the European Union. Uh, for today's session, uh, if I can just go on to uh, uh, just to briefly introduce you to who I am. Uh, my name is Leighton Ernstberger. I'm the Director for Education and English with the British Council. I'm based in Singapore um, and I work across the ASEAN region, Northeast Asia, um, China and Australasia uh, in our higher education and English language systems work. Um, I've been, you know, working uh, closely with Darren and the team on the EU Share Program, and as mentioned today, this is the first of six uh, uh, webinars that we will be holding in place of our 11th Policy Dialogue. So, on the panel, I'm uh, uh, joined today uh, by, you know, representatives from across ASEAN. So we have uh, Miss Mary, also known as Nina, 
Manusen, who's the head of education at the ASEAN Secretariat, Dr. Chilchis Terati, uh, executive director at the ASEAN University Network, Mr. Kohei Yamada, program officer at Simia Ryhead, and our team leader for the EU Share Program, Darren McDermott. Uh, if we go to the next slide, if that's okay, um, I'll just introduce you a little bit to the SHARE program. If you haven't had the chance to join uh, our previous policy dialogues or if you've not worked with our team, uh, the, the European Union uh, uh, sponsored this particular program. It's known as the Support for Higher Education in the ASEAN region. Uh, its main objectives are, are uh, to support regional cooperation and mobility um, across the ASEAN community. And, and also to boost uh, cooperation between ASEAN and the European Union, creating those lasting benefits that you know higher education can can really bring to the overall relationship between these two very important regions, uh, you know, globally speaking. If we go to the next slide, the uh, there are four components to the share program. The British Council uh, is this is the lead of the consortium, and we work on the policy dialogues. Uh, we work very closely with DAAD and ENQA, um, who are leading the qualifications framework and quality assurance work. Credit transfer systems, you know, work is, uh, you know, now being led by the British Council, and we work uh, with NAPIC on student mobility and the associated scholarship program with the SHEP program. If we go to the next uh, uh, slide, the particular objectives for uh, the policy dialogue series is to have a look at you know how share can test scalability and transfer if you like the uh, uh, the benefits of the share program that uh, uh, you know that we've been working on together to sort of embed it within the ASEAN processes. We do want to check in and see what the impact uh, and the challenges that are uh, posed by the COVID nineteen and to you know see what the relevant adaptations are. We want to use the opportunity to pilot relevant activities, risk mitigation, to so identify emerging developments and innovations that the higher education sector is producing and to see how they're relevant to the overall, you know, sort of intra ASEAN collaboration. Finally, we would like to discuss the long term prospects for the development of the ASEAN higher education space, and that takes us very much in today uh, in to today's session so if we go to the next slide um as you will guess by the title of of this session we are looking you know uh you know with re uh, representatives from uh from asec simio ryehead and aun as well as the share program what is the future of the higher education space in asean and to understand how we can maintain momentum towards greater uh, integration greater mobility um, in the higher education space and you know how to do that while obviously making the necessary adjustments that have been brought upon by COVID-19. The format for the session today, if we can go to the next uh, slide. I'll just wrap up my, my introduction shortly and, and I will introduce each of the presenters uh, one by one, giving you a very you know, short introduction for each. Each uh, presenter will have about ten minutes to to uh, you know share with you their particular thoughts um, on the sort of long term future for the sort of um, intra ASEAN uh, you know, sort of program and mobility. That will leave us about forty minutes for group discussions and question and answers. I would ask if you can in the chat function to share with us questions that you would like to ask the panelists. Um, I will save them up to the end. So if you can include in your question who you would like that question to be directed to. So if you would like it to be directed to, to uh, Ms. Madison, Dr. Chiltis, uh, Mr. Kohei, or, or uh, Mr. McDermott, then please just put that in your question and we'll make sure that it gets asked. And then at the very end, I'll, I'll uh, just introduce you to the next policy dialogue, which is tomorrow and, and to the other four policy dialogues, which will follow for the rest of this month. So if I can take this uh, op opportunity now then to introduce our uh, first speaker. Um, Ms. Manusen joined the, uh, uh, the Education, Youth and Sports Division of the ASEAN Secretariat uh, November last year. She is responsible for the operational management of, of the sectors controlled by 
the division as well as seeing uh, overseeing the development and implementation and evaluation of the programs that sort of are supported and implemented by the ASEAN socio-cultural community. Prior to joining the ASEAN Secretariat, uh, uh, Ms. Manu uh, various roles with the UNESCO education sector, uh, particularly serving as a regional uh, in the regional bureau in Thailand and the country offices in the, in the Republic of Iran. And uh, she's also had the pleasure of working for the uh, uh, for Simio as well in the past. So thank you so much for joining us, Nina. And I'd like to hand over to you for your presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, uh, thanks very much, Leighton, for the very kind introduction. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to talk about how the ASEAN Secretariat is contributing to the development of a higher education space in the region, despite the challenges brought about by COVID-19. Next slide, please. I'd like to start this presentation by posing some questions. Uh, first, how has COVID-19 impacted or how will it impact ASEAN's work in creating a higher education space? Are our current working mechanisms and policy frameworks adaptive and responsive to this kind of disruption? What can we do about it? And finally, how can the ASEAN Secretariat play a facilitative role going forward? Please keep these questions in mind throughout this presentation. My presentation will not in any way attempt to answer these questions directly, but hopefully will provide the basis to address these issues. On the 14th of April, 2020, ASEAN heads of state held a special ASEAN summit via video conference. At this summit, ASEAN leaders called for the development of a post-pandemic recovery plan. This plan will need to address the steps needed to reopen the economy and society, recover from both the health and economic crisis, while still having to keep in step with ASEAN's community building and regional integration agenda. In response to this call from leaders, one of the ongoing initiatives under the ASEAN Social Cultural Community Pillar that I wish to highlight is a rapid assessment on the impacts of COVID-19 on ASEAN with a focus on vulnerable populations. In collaboration with the Asia Foundation, one of the chapters or sections of this rapid assessment will look at the impacts of COVID-19 on the education sector, specifically the closing of schools and universities, as well as restrictions on student movement. The rapid assessment will also offer a synthesis of key reports and trends on educational impact of the educational impact of the pandemic looking at the primary, secondary, and higher education sectors, as well as technical and vocational education and training. It will also do a stock taking of current measures that are um, being introduced to mitigate the impact, um, including online and distance learning, automatic promotion, et cetera. The short-term and long-term recommendations res resulting from this rapid assessment will be useful to the ASEAN Secretariat and relevant ASEAN sectoral bodies, part particularly the senior officials meeting on education in responding to COVID-19. Next slide, please. The role of higher education in ensuring the dynamic character of ASEAN is best seen when one looks more closely at the collective element of a creative, innovative, and responsive ASEAN. Creativity, innovation, and responsiveness are held to be elements of ASEAN's dynamism. To this end, higher education figures prominently in the strategic measures listed in the ASEAN Social Cultural Community Blueprint 2025. These include enhancing competitiveness through lifelong learning, pathways, equivalencies, and skills development, promoting an innovative ASEAN approach to higher education, strengthening regional and global cooperation in higher education, and developing a system of continuous training and retraining to support lifelong learning and workforce development. Next slide, please. In particular, higher education is a critical area of work globally and within the region. In 2015, ASEAN leaders adopted the Kuala Lumpur Declaration on Higher Education, which recognizes the important role that higher education plays in ensuring the competitiveness of ASEAN and its sustained development. Among others, ASEAN leaders committed to 
uphold the quality of higher education, and work towards increasing intra-ASEAN student mobility. Globally, Sustainable Development Goal 4 seeks to attain equal access to technical and vocational education and training and higher education, ensure the provision of relevant skills for decent work, and harness education for sustainable development and global citizenship. Next slide, please. Regionally, ASEAN is in the midst of implementing the ASEAN Social Cultural Community Blueprint 2025. This blueprint has as its vision an inclusive, sustainable, resilient, and dynamic ASEAN community that engages and benefits the peoples. To this end, higher education is a vital contributor towards ensuring a dynamic ASEAN. Next slide, please. The ASEAN Social Cultural Community Blueprint 2025 is operationalized through the ASEAN Work Plan on Education 2016-2020. Higher education is an important priority for ASEAN, as evidenced by two of the eight sub-goals in the work plan being focused on this subsector. Strengthen the higher education sector through the implementation of robust quality assurance mechanisms and foster the role of higher education in the area of socioeconomic development through university industry partnership. Our completed and ongoing activities in higher education include the following. Implementation of an ASEAN Regional Quality Assurance Framework and its established information linkages. The development of regional quality assurance mechanisms at the institutional level in ASEAN by utilizing the AUN Quality Assurance Network, the continuous referencing of national qualifications frameworks to the ASEAN Qualifications Reference Framework, the establishment of a working group to consider mobility activities, the implementation of cross-border education programs, and undertaking a series of studies looking at intra-ASEAN student mobility, student visa regulations in ASEAN, and the prospects of establishing a single branded ASEAN scholarship. The majority of these activities are implemented in large part through the EU support to higher education in the ASEAN region project. I will leave Darren to discuss these in more detail later on. Next slide, please. ASEAN's work in education, in general, is guided by its post-2015 vision on education, which was adopted by ASEAN education ministers in 2014. As we speak, the ASEAN Secretariat is in the midst of preparing the next ASEAN Work Plan on Education 2021-2025, which will be underpinned by the principles of people-centeredness, ASEAN awareness, sustainable development, and quality inclusive education and lifelong learning. Higher education will remain front and center in this new work plan. Now, I'd like to close this presentation by reiterating these questions. How has COVID-19 impacted or how will it impact ASEAN's work in creating a higher education space? Are our current working mechanisms and policy frameworks adaptive and responsive to this kind of disruption? What can we do about it? How can the ASEAN Secretariat play a facilitative role going forward? Our activities may have been act affected by COVID-19 in one way or another, but together with our key partners present here, we remain committed to advance the creation of an ASEAN higher education space. This very webinar is proof that we will find creative ways to carry out our activities despite the circumstances. Consultations related to the development of the next ASEAN Education Work Plan will likewise have to proceed virtually for the time being. Together, we will strive to resume our work safely with the new normal arrangements. Going forward, the ASEAN Secretariat will continue to engage with key stakeholders in the ASEAN region, particularly EU Share, CMU RIHED, and AUN, to ensure that the creation of an ASEAN higher education space remains a key priority in building a people-centered ASEAN community. Next slide, please. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Nina, for the uh, uh, 
for that presentation. It was really helpful and really uh, uh, informative, and we'll be coming back to you with some questions later. We've had a lot of hellos in the uh, comments section. Welcome, everybody. We have people uh, joining from the Netherlands, uh, uh, from Brussels. We have people joining from across ASEAN, sort of Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore. Very pleased to welcome you all with us. We also have colleagues joining us uh, from Japan, and we have with us an alumnus of the SHARE program from Vietnam and South Korea. So welcome to everybody. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, I would like to introduce our next speaker, if that's OK. If everybody can continue to use the chat function uh, to also put in questions that you might want to uh, uh, direct towards Ms. Uh, um, uh, Nina, then that would be great. But I would like to introduce Dr. Chultis, who is our next uh, speaker. Dr. Chultis is currently um, the executive director of the ASEAN Universities Network. It's an intergovernmental organization that uh, uh, sits under the ASEAN Secretariat. He is also a lecturer in politics at the Faculty of Political Science in uh, Chalalongong Korn University, Thailand. I hope I got that right. The smile on your face implies not, but it was close enough. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> Dr. Chultis has been teaching normative political theory uh, at University since 1996, and his academic interests include history of Western political thought, philosophy, uh, philosophical idealism, and political ethics. Working with the, you know, public sector, he's also been uh, taught at the UN since 2009, works in public sector strategies, policy consultancy, and human resource development. Uh, to the work of the regional and multilateral collaboration amongst universities in Southeast Asia, which I think sets you up perfectly now for your presentation, Dr. Chultis, and I'll, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Leighton. Uh, thank you very much. I would like to express my gratitude to the organizer of this uh, crucial webinar series of the EU Share for inviting the AUN to join this this. Uh, first session. Um, looking ahead to what will be happening to higher education in ASEAN under the current global situation is probably very difficult and maybe a pure speculation to me. But I'm happy to share with you what the AUN is faring at, at the moment. Um, moving on to my first uh, slide. Um, I I like to just to recap some of the current trends, uh, which are part of the context of our higher education at the, at the moment. Actually, these are the the uh, on this slide is a, a common knowledge. So I I only want to highlight only some. Um, Right now, I, I think we already heard from, from the, the first speaker that the first priority of everyone is, is about health and, and safety, which co constitute uh, the very, very uh, first priority for all the university in, in our region. Uh, th that's un undeniable. But in terms of the economics, Priorities are expected to be on the, the internal recovery and economic reconstruction. So it, it remains to be seen how, how these uh, internal policies and economic reconstruction will, will somehow affect what, what will be happening to, to our universities. As for the geopolitics, uh, we are observing and expecting a very fragile international cooperation uh, resulting from uh, mainly from distrust among the, the world powers. The, then the question will be on how much our polarized world and the deglobalization or some say that is a kind of a globalization will affect the global cooperation in higher education in, in the ASEAN region. For the higher education itself, we see the trend of integrating online learning with face-to-face uh, -face learning. 
for me personally, the differences of the world between pre-COVID-19 and post-COVID-19 uh, may not be as big as we thought. Many trends are already there or ongoing before the outbreak of the, the pandemic. This pandemic may only expose hidden problems or inconvenient truths about the current system and institutional practices, of, such as the, the, the gap, uh, the, the huge gap between those who can afford online learning and those who, who cannot. Or for example, the need for uh, more teacher training particularly to cope with how to use the, the, the online or distance technology in, in their teaching. Another example is the, the importance of the investment uh, from the government or from the university in distance learning. So I'd like to move to my next slide uh, after given uh, given you the, the context, I just want to share with you the, the framework showing how AUN works, uh, how the ASEAN University Network works, which is very really easy because everything is centered around uh, the, the notion of the talent. We put uh, the notion of talent at, at the heart of our projects and activities. Uh, that is to say, how to manage talents and the institution of talents is the key to, to my work in getting the universities to collaborate together. And um, this is just, just to highlight in passing that for, for, for the AUN, we, we see everyone as a, a talent in, in, in some way or the other. Now, I'd like to move to my last slide which I, I like to share with you some of the, the AUN's current activities in response to the, the changing situation. Uh, our last physical gatherings was in, in early uh, February this year. We, we could organize one student activity and, and one AUN quality assurance program assessment. Then we started the series of cancellation and postponement of activities. As of today, we, we already cancel or postpone over 60 uh, activities so far. With some activities that have been moved to online platform. So I, I like to uh, keep you updated with our current uh, works. Um, on the slide, we, we, uh, first of all, uh, the AUN is going to to have a discussion among ourselves first on revisiting the idea of the university. Uh, it will be done in our presidents, rectors, and vice vice chancellor uh, meeting. Hopefully, it can be organized uh, next year as a face-to-face -face meeting. Also in progress is in, in the area of uh, AUN quality assurance. We are going to deploy uh, the distance site visit in our assessment at the study program level. Uh, in, incidentally, uh, tomorrow our uh, QA council will, will give the final approval of, of this move as I, I mentioned earlier that right now everything is a, a mixture between the online and, and, and physical or offline. Um, we also, under the AUNQA work, we also uh, organize a lot of uh, intensive virtual training. Uh, for example, we, we organize the, uh, a coaching training for those who prepare the, the self-assessment report in the, in the quality assurance area. Also, we, 
under the AUN through our sub network, such as the AUN uh, Technology Enhanced Personali Personalized Learning, uh, hosted by Singapore Management University. They also organize once a month uh, webinar series. Uh, for example, they organize how to create effective, impactful instructional uh, videos or how to use analytic system to guide students in acquiring info literacy competencies. And next week, they're also organizing a webinar on the design, cho uh, design choices in the university-wide learning outcome feedback system for the 21st century uh, skills. That's, that's one example of what, what we are doing through the, the sub-network. A, a lot of them uh, have migrated to, to online activities so far. Apart from that, we also organize some webinars with our partner in, for example, in, in Europe. We organize the, the remote attendance learning model uh, with uh, over 500 participants in, in one go. Also, we, we plan to organize uh, uh, some webinar series with our partner in the ASEAN Australia Education Dialogue. Uh, one of the topic, of course, will focus on student mobility, which is a hot issue right now. So, apart from that, one of our uh, sub network is on uh, culture and the arts. They are also planning to do a kind of ASEAN Art Festival week. Everything will be done online. So I am imagining. I try to imagine how, how they are going to do uh, cultural performance training or collaborative uh, stage and art performances. Uh, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to see how, how, how they are going to, to organize this, uh, this online activity for the culture and the arts. For the academic conference, it's, it's, quite, it's easier. It's easier. Apart from that, we also plan to do some, some kind of uh, a student conference. We, we plan to do it in November, also online, uh, with uh, students, uh, 100, over 100 students from all 10 ASEAN countries. Uh, that remains to be seen. Uh, and this is what i like to share to you all for, for this round. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Schultes. That was really helpful. And it's great to see how activity is happening despite all the disruptions of COVID-19. And uh, I think some op opportunities come, of course, with going virtually, because I feel like we've got a, a number of time zones connected here through the presentation, and we've been getting lots of warm words as well. So I look forward to seeing how the student conference goes in November. Um, I'd like to introduce my next speaker, if uh, that's OK, the next speaker for the program, Mr. Kohei Yamada. Uh, he's an education development professional and currently works with Simeo Raihead, a Southeast Asian Minister of Education Organization, Regional Development. Uh, his work involves facilitating multilateral collaborations among key stakeholders uh, in regional higher education, including the relevant ministries, universities, and students. No, no small ask there. Uh, he coordinates the ASEAN International Mobility for Students AIMS program, uh, uh, which is the which Rai has flagship initiative for promoting uh, academic mobility within the region and beyond. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, uh, Mr. Rai. Let me hand over. Um, thank you so much for your kind introduction, as well as inviting Simio Rai to be part of the Share Policy Dialogue. There are a lot to take home from the previous two uh, presentations, but for my part, I would like to share the situation of the student mobility during the COVID-19 pandemic from the account of the AIMS program. Can I go next slide? Um, for those of you who may not be familiar with the work of Simeo Raihe, we are an international organization based in Bangkok 
supported by 11 member countries of CIMIA. Um, tracing back the history, Red Hat was originally conceived in Singapore in 1959 as the Regional Institute for Higher Education and Development. Then, with the coordination of uh, CIMIA Secretariat and the government of Thailand, Red Hat was moved under the umbrella of CIMIA in 1993 as the CIMIA Center specializing in higher education and development. Next slide, please. Um, here at CIMIA Red Hat, we carry out a number of regional initiatives in the field of higher education in Southeast Asia. Um, the Asian International Mobility, Mobility for Students program, as known as AIMS program, is one of our flagship programs to promote the student mobility in the region. The program was launched in 2010 by Senior Right Head together with the government of Malaysia, Indonesia, and Thailand. It is a multilateral student exchange program that involves both government and also the universities in the management and the operation of the student mobility. The implementation of the program is based on two underlying principles. One is the sustainability and the other one is the balanced mobility. The sustainability principle ensures that each member country provides support for their own participation in the program and move forward based on their own academic readiness. On the other hand, the balanced mobility principle promotes the balanced flow of inbound and outbound students at both institutional and the national levels. Um, with these principles, the AIMS has been growing since its establishment and it has offered exchange opportunity to nearly 5,000 students with the 78 universities from nine countries. And this includes the countries of in Southeast Asia, as well as Japan and the Republic of Korea. Um, so as you see, it is an extensive university network. And then we conducted a survey in March to May in order to examine and really understand the situation of the member universities in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic and how they are coping with these challenges. So I would like to share some of the key findings from our survey. Next slide, please. Well, um, during the previous month, we were able to get a good amount of information through the survey that may represent the impact of the pandemic on the operation of the student mobility. At the same time, as I mentioned, because the survey was carried out in between March and May, we are aware that some of the university may face a slightly different situation now, depending on when the response was provided. But based on the the information given to us, we now know that there has been a great impact on the, the different aspects of the student mobility program. As you see in the graph in the slide, the uh, vast majority of member universities are required to change their class plans and also the reduce the inbound and outbound flows. About a half of the universities responded to the situation by adjusting academic calendar, including the admission schedule. Also, we can see the general increasing trend of the shift towards the online learning. And in some cases, students who were going to join the exchange had to withdraw their application and the participation. Next slide, please. So uh, this slide gives an overview of how universities have been responding to the situation in their role. In our AIMS network, about 60% of the universities have been physically closing their campuses, while another 40% managed to continue the university's operation without the closure. What is the most common among member universities, whether, whether their campuses are closed or not, is that many of them started to utilize online tools and platforms to replace face-to-face -face activities, including the classes and the orientations. Another observable thing is that the universities have been adjusting the timeline, sending out and also receiving new students by advising them to apply for the next year 
or deferring student application schedules. So we think that this makes sense and also inevitable, especially when many countries in the region impose the international travel restriction and other measures to control the people's movement. Next slide, please. So based on the information provided, we have also identified a common challenges that universities confront. As for the student support system, many of them are on the way to shift towards the online learning, but there should be the communication support from the universities to really ensure that the students are able to access online classes and resources. Another important point shared was the provision of the psychological assistance to maintain the student's well-being. Um, this aspect is sometimes overlooked, but it is particularly relevant and important for international students who face the pandemic during their mobility in foreign countries. There are challenges regarding ICT as well. Some universities reported the insufficient ICT resources to promote online learning. Others said the challenges um, for both lecturers and students as they are new to the transition to the online learning as well as teaching so that they needed more time to get used to the technology application. Another relevant um, point is that universities find it difficult to ensure the cultural exposure for students when group activities and uh, cultural activities are restricted. So they needed to come up with a way to somehow help students gain cultural experiences through online platforms. Next, please. Um, so in terms of the, the good practices, uh, there was a case that university provided a financial support to the students as a subsidy for their data package purchase because of the, the increased use of the internet the connection usage. In other cases, lecturers support the provision of the online learning through utilizing various means. And this includes interactive online teaching and pre-recorded videos for students to access resources. And this was also used for showing the demonstration or experiments in some specific subjects. In terms of the student assessment, Universities advise lecturers or department to replace the physical examinations with alternative assessment methods, such as online exams or take-home exams in order to avoid the gathering of people. Next slide, please. Um, the AIMS program and the way forward, as much as the pandemic affected universities in their operation of the student mobility, here at the program secretariat, we do feel the need to adapt a new approach in terms of the management of the program and also a direction the program is moving towards. From the management side, uh, we decided to carry out the AIM steering committee meeting virtually this year for the first time. So this meeting is held once a year to discuss uh, management matters of the program and then we have already informed to all the member countries and the steering committee members to join the meeting in July. At this meeting, um, one of the agenda we will discuss this time is the possibility of trying blended mobility in the AIMS program. So because of the pandemic, we are now aware of the increased importance and also the relevance of the virtual mobility. We also know that it has a great potential for the social inclusion in offering international experiences. Um, so at the meeting, we would like to discuss with the steering committee members how we can integrate the component of both the virtual and the physical mobility into the program structure. It is indeed a challenging attempt to push forward because especially when we have a, such an extensive university network, but we do think that a key is to utilize a multilateral structure, structure the AIMS program has, which is the involvement of the both government and also the universities to really make sure that the, whatever changes we are trying to propose 
will be sustained with the ownership of the each stakeholder. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, with that, I would like to conclude my presentation. Um, thank you for your attention and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Mr. Kohei. That was really helpful. And it's great to see how the program is trying to address the digital divide, which I think comes very clear in this period of disruption. Uh, but also hearing more about the blended mo uh, mobility program. I'm sure we'll get lots of questions. We have quite a few coming through the chat now. now. So uh, thank you to everyone who's been sharing questions and identifying who they're directed to. So please continue. So uh, as we move on to, uh, I will uh, McDermott, uh, the team leader for the uh, European Union support to higher education in the ASEAN Bien Share program, as it is known. Uh, Darren has over 15 years uh, of experience in Asia. He's held academic roles in Japan and Ireland. In uh, 2013, uh, uh, Darren joined the uh, the EU um, as an EU expert on the international policy and strategy. Thailand 2015, follow that up with the uh, Thailand, um, uh, 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 you know, the support policy dialogue uh, there as well. And you've been working with us on the SHARE program over the last couple of years as well. And we're very pleased to welcome you now as the team leader designate. And we would like to hand, uh, hand over to you now to just take us away with your presentation. Thank you very much, Leighton, and good afternoon to friends and colleagues in ASEAN and Asia. And good morning to those of you joining us from Europe. I'd like to extend my great thanks and appreciation to Nina, Dr. Choltis, and, and Kohei for their excellent contributions to the opening session of SHARE's first digital policy dialogue. I'd also like to express my great appreciation to Leighton for moderating the session. If we could move over to the next slide, please. So uh, SHARE's approach to supporting regional higher education is inclusive. The program engages with ASEAN, non-ASEAN entities to build on existing initiatives, such as those of the ASEAN Secretariat, the AUN, and Simeo Raihed, to strengthen regional cooperation and internationalization of ASEAN higher education. So as Leighton said, I joined the SHARE program uh, at the end of February as team leader designate. Having been involved intermittently in the program over the last number of years, uh, I was very pleased to have an opportunity to become more directly involved. It's certainly been a different start than I had envisaged, but there's been learning in that too. So a key dimension of the SHARE program is the provision of the SHARE scholarship, uh, building on existing initiatives of Simeo Raihed's Asian International Mobility for Students program, and also the ASEAN University Networks program. The SHARE scholarship promotes short-term credit-bearing student mobility across the ASEAN region. And to date, SHARE has dispersed 489 intra-ASEAN mobility scholarships to five batches of students. Mobility is rightly viewed as a catalyst and a conduit to greater harmonization and internationalization within ASEAN. And this holds true. Uh, but we need to strive to maintain momentum now that the concept of freedom of movement across borders is, is somewhat challenged. Next slide, please. So SHARE has established partnerships with 32 universities in eight ASEAN countries, and you can see them here. Uh, this has created a, an ecosystem uh, for SHARE to test the outcomes uh, of the scholarship program that promotes student mobility in ASEAN. And it also provides direct feedback for further progress of our other key result areas of qualifications frameworks, quality assurance, and a credit transfer system. SHARE was in the process of preparing for its sixth batch of scholarships with these institutions when the implications of COVID-19 became clear. Next slide, please. So on March 11th, the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a pandemic and travel restrictions came into force across Southeast Asia shortly afterwards. On March 23rd, the SHARE program released an announcement to the wider community of partners, stakeholders and participants on decisions reached within the consortium as an initial response to COVID-19. 
Uh, these included the suspension of all share program travel, the movement of share meetings and activities to digital channels, and the postponement of batch six of the share scholarship, which had been due to take place in July uh, and has been postponed uh, for the moment. So it was very important for us to understand the impacts of COVID-19 on the ASEAN higher education community, and specifically uh, the, the partner university uh, network of SHARE and its scholarship recipients. So to this end, uh, two surveys were disseminated to gather quantitative and qualitative data on how SHARE's partner universities and alumni were responding and adapting to COVID-19. And this has been followed up on uh, with country by country focus groups, uh, which we are due to complete this week. So today I'd like to share some initial findings of the institutional survey with you on the basis of responses by 30 of the share partner universities to our survey between May 4th and May 15th. So next slide, please. Uh, so we can see that between the period of May 4th and May 15th, uh, that 50% of universities were reporting themselves closed. Uh, we can see that uh, there were varying degrees uh, of closure and, and duration of closure, um, with some institutions being closed indefinitely uh, and others uh, not sure uh, what the policy uh, was of, of the institution or the national policy. Next slide, please. So institutions reported a number of ways they were facilitating teaching and learning for students. Uh, and these included online classes, online consultations, on-demand webinars, uh, and use of learning management systems. Next slide, please. So only five out of 30 institutions said they were not providing online courses for students. Uh, and the, the greater majority um, either had a blended learning uh, approach in place uh, or were able to uh, rally and, and adapt uh, to, to COVID-19 and, and bring in place such provision. Next slide. So infrastructure and communication between students and lecturers were cited as the biggest challenges in online provision at this, in this period. And the next slide, please. So despite the challenges, 97% of share partners are either somewhat likely or likely to expand their online course provision. And this is uh, encouraging and it, it sees a, an increasing acceptance uh, of online modalities. Next slide, please. We did ask institutions, um, did they think uh, that, that SHARE should assist ASEAN universities in developing capacity on online education? And uh, the, there was a resounding yes uh, to that question. 93% uh, expressed the view that SHARE should assist uh, them in developing capacity and online education provision. And some of the, the key qualitative uh, responses to this uh, or the areas in which SHARE could provide assistance was on convening of dialogues to exchange ideas and practices with ASEAN institutions, capacity building to improve online teaching and learning, including in the areas of assessment and QA, and recommendations for improving inclusion and access for students. Um, and we have designed uh, our policy dialogue, and I think if you look at the, the forthcoming sessions in the policy dialogue, we'll touch on many of these areas, uh, and we have uh, a great panel of expertise uh, to, to look uh, at these areas in, in more detail. So SHARE is compiling this preliminary data and the initial qualitative data from country by country focus groups to meet our part partner universities' needs with an evidence-based approach. Next slide, please. So the death toll and knock-on effects of COVID-19 are shocking to us all. And in addition to the cost to individuals and institutions, the disruption to students' education outcomes are a great cause for concern. At this critical juncture, it's imperative we re-examine our approach to internationalization and determine how to innovate and adapt our strategy. While student mobility is a key dimension of internationalization, it must be noted that approximately 5 million internationally mobile students 
still represents only 2.5% of the 200 million current students worldwide. Bringing in the internationalization agenda to a wider population of ASEAN students and institutions through internationalization at home, internationalization of the curriculum, and blended learning and collaborative online international learning are all opportunities to be grasped. And we hope to have uh, continued discussion on these over the, the coming weeks of the policy dialogue. Next slide, please. So we're still very much at a point where we have many more questions than answers, and perhaps that's an important part of the process. As with any crisis, there are opportunities, opportunities to reflect, reconsider, and reevaluate long-held beliefs, ways of working, and strategies. The horizon on the road ahead for internationalization in ASEAN in the time of COVID-19 has yet to come into view. And it's not yet clear if student mobility can ever really return to the way it was before 2020. What is clear is what happens to us after the COVID-19 pandemic will largely depend on the decisions we take together during the COVID-19 pandemic. Focusing on cohesive, adaptable solutions is likely to serve us better than temporary measures. And in line with that, our strategies will be more sustainable if they're developed as part of structured dialogues within communities of practice, within regional frameworks. We in the SHARE program will continue with our colleagues on this panel and the wider higher education community in ASEAN to convene and participate in such dialogues. I'd like to thank you for your time and kind attention, and I'm really looking forward to the discussion and the questions to follow. I'll hand back to you, Leighton. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you so much uh, to everyone on the panel. We've been getting questions through as we hear. So we have a number of questions for each of our panelists. Uh, but if I can turn first to you, Nina, if that's OK, as our first pa panelist up, we hear through those presentations that uh, obviously COVID-19 has thrown up a number of challenges, um, but also op opportunities to maybe make internationalization uh, more inclusive uh, through either blended programs or internationalization at home. So I, I was just wondering whether any of the, the opportunities that arise through COVID-19 uh, might be featuring in ASIC's plan and building uh, uh, the ASEAN ed um, education plan and you know how you might be reaching out to AG stakeholders to implement that plan. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much, Leighton, for that question. As I mentioned earlier, we're currently in the process of uh, formulating the next uh, ASEAN Work Plan 2021-2025. And we see this as an important opportunity to um, uh, engage on a much deeper level uh, with key partners such as uh, EU Share, uh, AUN, and uh, Senior Raihead. Who we uh, and we intend to um, involve these key stakeholders moving forward um, in the development of this work plan. Um, as I mentioned in my presentation, um, we remain committed to advancing um, the ASEAN work plan on education broadly, but also um, and more importantly, our um, uh, activities and projects uh, in higher education. Um, so, as I mentioned, um, uh, our work may have been affected by um, the pandemic, but it's certainly not stopping us from um, uh, continuing to coordinate with um, our partners, particularly SHARE. We've been having a lot of um, uh, virtual meetings to, um, uh, to continue our work. Um, and um, we are um, um, also looking forward to um, uh, the ASEAN, uh, the new ASEAN work plan in education, where um, actually we consider uh, the EU share uh, program as uh, its centerpiece. Thank you. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Nina, for that feedback and a bit of a forward look into how the plan will be uh, uh, developed and shared. Uh, we have a lot of questions coming through um, for Dr. Chiltis. We're having quite an interesting debate, actually, an exchange of ideas, actually, around um, 
the you know the online event and the sort of distant site visit program. So if I if I can turn to you, uh, Dr. Chalters, you might have seen some of the questions coming through. The question that sort of triggered it all off, if you like, are you know, how the online events are open to viewers and participants from outside the region. Uh, that you know that includes obviously our colleagues in the European Union. But I, uh, there was also a really interesting debate going on about uh, distant site visit programs and what are the main challenges faced by sort of AUN QA team in implementing this program. So, do you want to share some thoughts on that? Right. Uh, thank you, Leighton. Um, I, I like to separate two kinds of event. What one is related to quality assurance, and another is 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 non non QA stuff. Uh, for example, how how can we teach online is the the main uh, uh, the top uh, interesting uh, topic that that can capture many uh, audience from the Southeast Asia. Uh, actually, we organize the the uh, webinar on on this topic is. It's a collaboration of AUN with the Deusto University in, in Basque Country, Spain. Uh, at that event is, is open worldwide. <laughs> it's not limited only to, to Southeast Asia, but uh, most of the participants uh, are from, were from uh, Southeast Asia, 50% uh, from 500 from Vietnam. Um, apart from that, the some of our webinar series are quite limited to to the Southeast Asian region only, and there will be a lot more coming soon. But and, and it's a mixture between a, a large audience and and a limited audience. Uh, our the the problem we face was that um, when, when we organize a webinar with a capacity of more than 500 participants. Uh, we, we face a lot of uh, te technical problems. Actually, in that event, uh, people register 1,700. We'll come back. Chilters. Yes. Uh, do you hear me? Yes. Uh, Leighton, are you there? Okay. Uh, uh, in that particular event, people register around one thousand seven hundred, but on 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 the 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 day we organize it, uh, uh, seven hundred to eight hundred try to to get in the system, but um, only for four hundred to five hundred uh, participant could could get in. To, to that to, to that lecture so so right now we we're talking among ourselves uh, possibly the a smaller capacity webinar may be better uh, in, in when, when we want to organize it in, in Southeast Asian region uh, th that's for the part of the the non non QA uh, stuff for the quality assurance uh, in in Southeast Asia uh, led by the, the ASEAN University Network, we have a service for, for our universities in the region to, to have their, uh, their study program or de degree programs assessed by, by our assessor. It's not accreditation, it's not non-binding, it's a, a very peer assessment service. We've done that for, for 20 years now. And right now, after the, the outbreak, uh, we, we quickly get together and, and devise the, the, the plan to, to do the site visit by a, a distance uh, or online means. And uh, as of today, over 10, 10 universities, more, more than 10 universities offer to be uh, to 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 get into this uh, distance site visit in in the first batch, we hope to to start doing it around uh, end of July or 
or early August because that that involve a lot of uh, preparation. So th that's for me for now. Thank you, Leighton. Yep. 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 Well, you can see in the comments that there's a lot of of uh, interest in the detail of how you're implementing the number of days it's taking. So I think there'll be lots of uh, people knocking on your door if that's all right for you, to, <laughs> just to learn more from your experience there. Yeah. Um, and I just have a question here for Mr. Yamada. There was a number of uh, questions that also came through during your presentation. And also talking about, uh, you know, one that's always in the back of my head as well. But, you know, what, you know, what do you think the quality imbalances could be of conducting online learning during the pandemic? And what impact that might have to the credit transfer system between ASEAN universities? I think there's also a good follow up question uh, that, uh, you know, you may also want to field at the same time around whether virtual mobility programs can achieve the primary objectives of student um, mobility. Yes, uh, thank you for the question. Um, I think this well, one. Sorry, I mean, either one of those. Uh, take it. Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. And I think this is really important, especially when it comes to the quality um, gap in balance between the different universities, sometimes within the same countries or across the, the countries within the same region. Um, so like when we talk, we, we've been hearing presentation from the different speakers and I think especially the, the survey responses from the SHARE program that Darren talked about also noted the biggest challenges for the online learning is that the lack of the resources infrastructure of the, the universities. And I think and another point that this is the data we collected through the survey in AIMS program is that the capacity of the universities, including preparedness, level preparedness for the lecturers as well as the students in transition on the, to the online learning as well as the teaching. It is not a, there's no straightforward answer to this question, how we can immediately solve this problem. But I think what we can do is to um, like how facilitate the regional cons consultation among the stakeholders, especially the policy makers, uh, to have a relevant sound um, policies and also within the community of the university sharing some good practices. And this includes the practices of the credit transfer um, the system. So I think that's something that we can do. So key is to dialogue and also this is going to lead to the, the sustainability of any kind of efforts we're going to do in the post COVID-19 pandemic. Great, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, and uh, just to follow a question to that really is, uh, do you think this could be an opportunity to include more students in the mobility program? You know, Darren was mentioning that, you know, physical mo uh, mobility is relatively restricted, but with an opportunity for blended or other forms of internationalization, how do, you, uh, do you see this offering new solutions for to make the program more inclusive? Um, yes, I think um, this time also poses as a um, timely opportunity to really rethink the concept of the university, as well as the concept of the, the student mobility in higher education. And also our target students in the universities are relatively, uh, compared with the basic education, they're old enough to really understand and handle online tools and they navigate themselves through the different tools and technologies. So there is an opportunity there and then of course, when it comes to virtual mobility, blended mobility, um, it has the potential to reach out to the, the group of people who were previously left behind from the mobility experiences. So I think that, that yes, there is opportunity. And I think we have to keep talking about it in the, the regional community and how we can enhance the capacity of the member universities of the different projects, as well as formulating the sound policy at the national level and also the university management perspective. Perfect, thank you so much for that. Um, I'll bring in Darren next, if that's okay. Though some of these questions I think 
would also be appropriate for Ms. Manusen. So after Darren, maybe I'll also ask, ask a couple of follow-up questions to Ms. Ms. Manusen. But there's a couple of shared questions, really, about um, uh, well, what's the best way to put it? I quite like this question that says, uh, you know, what is the actual ASEAN higher education space in, in the future? How do we support to the equality of university quality like the Bologna process? I mean, what can we learn from experiences in Europe um, and, and how that might be part of the future for ASEAN integration? If you wanted to share some ideas on that? Certainly. We'll pick up some um, other questions. I think it might be picked up in other dialogues, but if you can start with that. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, I think the uh, the raison d'etre or the, the starting point uh, for the SHARE program was that there was a great body of knowledge um, within the European context to, to draw on, uh, particularly in, in the regionalization, uh, the bringing together of very disparate higher education systems um, and, and looking uh, at, at not uh, uniformity, but uh, a harmonization uh, of those systems. So what an ASEAN higher education space looks like compared to an uh, European higher education area will naturally be very different. Uh, there, are, there are very different um, regions, very different communities uh, at work, and the structures uh, that, that operate uh, within them uh, in a higher education context are, are also quite different. Um, I'm Those who uh, know me well uh, are probably uh, tired of, uh, of me uh, quoting Dr. Supachai, uh, who's a former executive director uh, of the, the AUN. I never tire of it, though. Um, he, Dr. Supachai was also uh, an executive director of the Simeo, the Simeo Reihead um, when he said that, you know, we can compare the European experience as that of an orchestra, whereas uh, the, the ASEAN experience is, is that of a jazz band. And then the, the idea within that um, that uh, there's a much more central uh, approach perhaps in, in Europe, whereas within uh, ASEAN higher education systems, autonomy um, is, is highly valued. And the, the approach uh, to uh, the, the system and the development of a higher education space would need to be cognizant of that. So look, prediction uh, is, is very hard. Um, it's very difficult, particularly in the current context. Uh, it's important though that um, all of the stakeholders who've been heavily involved in higher education development within ASEAN over the, the last number of decades uh, are given an opportunity to engage with this, to have open, transparent uh, and joined up uh, discussions uh, on, on the approach to this. And I think then uh, we, we reach uh, a, a scenario where equality of, of institutions uh, and maintaining a, a quality level or, or high levels of quality across um, the region are maintained. Um, it's very much a work in progress, but uh, there's a, a real willingness um, for all these institutions and the, the ministries of each country involved to, to come together uh, and have a vision uh, of an ASEAN higher education space and how that will benefit the region as a whole. Right. Uh, you referenced quality there, and I know we have a session on quality assurance coming up, but we did have a couple of questions, and I'll ask this to uh, uh, to Ms. Manusin as well. But to start with you, Darren, just about what role do you see for the quality assurance bodies uh, in promoting ASEAN student mo uh, mobility? What, you know, what role do you see for Aquan in a particular aspect? Um, total uh, in involvement and, and total integration. Uh, I think quality has to be at the heart of, of everything we do. Uh, and we need to have that in, integrated uh, in, in all of the dimensions and, and all of the aspects uh, of, of internationalization and, and harmonization within the region. And I know that uh, the, the ASEAN Secretariat um, have that as a, a core belief as well. So I would like to um, hand over to Nina and have her, her thoughts on this. Yes, thanks, Darren. Um, yeah, just to build on, on what Darren uh, said earlier, we see a very important role going forward for um, the ASEAN Quality Assurance Network. Um, and thanks very much to um, uh, the gentleman who um, posed the question. Um, so just for everyone's information, uh, the ASEAN Quality Assurance Network 
is uh, actually um, an entity affiliated with um, ASEAN. Um, and they have developed a quality assurance framework um, to promote regional harmonization uh, in higher education. And this instrument could be used by ASEAN countries to benchmark and align their quality assurance systems in higher education. Um, it's actually very timely that you asked this question because just yesterday, um, uh, Akan reached out to us to see um, how we can um, uh, move ahead with formally endorsing and recognizing the um, ASEAN quali quality assurance framework. So um, we will look into this and um, uh, we um, remain committed to um, taking this forward, um, particularly since um, this is very um, important in um, the harmonization of um, uh, harmonization, as you know, is one of the key elements of um, the ASEAN higher education space. Thank you. Uh, just before I let you two go, and, and, and I'll ask this question of the other panelists as well by, by way of sign off, but I do think that there's an interesting question there about um, how mobility has to be inequalities, and you mentioned it in your presentation there. And so I'll throw the question to you as well uh, that I asked Mr. Yamada about how we think the opportunities coming out of the crisis might be able to sort of help reduce these inequalities uh, in the future. What might we build into the SHARE program? What might happen uh, uh, otherwise across the ASEAN region? So just your thoughts on that. And uh, maybe we'll get the same thoughts from Mr. Kohei, Dr. Chiltis, um, and Ms. Magnuson, and we can bring it to a vote. So I'll hand over to you, Darren. Thank you very much, uh, Leighton. Uh, certainly, th there is a great opportunity through technology um, to widen uh, the, the scope of, of internationalization and, and have greater access. Um, of course, there are questions of digital divide uh, and ensuring, uh, I think, as a Simeo Ryehead's survey also found uh, that infrastructure uh, is, is addressed. And, and to do this effectively, uh, we need to look beyond the boundaries of the higher education community uh, and engage the private sector, engage business, uh, and, and have them um, come in and, and assist um, where, where there are uh, potential uh, opportunities for greater infrastructure development. Um, equity, diversity, and inclusion are, are core aspects uh, in uh, the approach uh, to share, uh, and these run through uh, the program. Uh, so widening uh, the the experience, the internationalization experience, and not just let's say within uh, a narrow view of universities or um, you know, degree programs, but looking also at Tibet uh, and seeing how uh, internationalization can be brought into that domain as well. Is it the preserve of uh, third level education? Is it the preserve of higher education? Perhaps not. Um, to create an ASEAN identity, uh, to really create an ASEAN identity, we need to be approaching this at second level as well, um, or secondary school education. So uh, yeah, I think there, there are great opportunities now um, that perhaps weren't being considered uh, this time a year ago. Thank you very much for that. Um, I, uh, there was quite a good sort of supplement to that question for you, Mr. Yamada, I'll come to you next and then Mr. Chultis and then uh, Ms. Magnus after that. Is there an opportunity to include more more universities within the Ames program? Uh, we just had that question up on the screen a second ago, so I thought maybe you could look at the inclusion question also from the perspective of participation there. Thank you for the question. Uh, to begin with, I would like to explain how the membership works in AIMS program. It's a nomination based. So uh, the first country, Ministry of Education of the member country has to express their interest to join the program. And then we sign the agreement between senior right head and also the other member countries of the AIMS program. And then the country nominates the university to uh, participate in the mobility program. So yeah, participation to the uh, program is not entirely um, up to the university. So what we recommend is that universities, if 
if the university is interested in joining the program, they first need to approach the Ministry of Education in your own country and so that, that the Ministry of Education can bridge the communication between the universities and the CMRA head and then we can proceed that process. And of course, our ultimate goal is to include the, all the ASEAN CMRA member countries in Southeast Asia. Uh, so we are always keen to expand the membership, but also we are, there has been a challenge to really think about the sustainability of the participation. So it, it's a continuous dialogue between the government and also the university, because we don't want a situation where the university joined first year, but no sending or receiving students after second year. So there should be the solid mechanism shared at the national level and also the regional level. So yes, but yeah, we are aiming to include more member universities as well as the, the countries. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that, uh, Mr. Kohei. And uh, Dr. Tots, is this your views on, on how the opportunities, if you like, that are coming up through the crisis and your work with the SHARE program? Uh, how we thank, can you. Sort of... uh, thank you, Leighton. I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, the right really... program. <laughs> and, <laughs> And I, in terms of the, the credit transfer system that can be of assistance to, to the student mobility, I, I got a high hope that uh, somehow uh, through the EU share project, uh, we can have a, a single, uh, I mean, combine all the <laughs> existing, existing credit transfer system in Southeast Asia, combine together and have only one single system. Um, as for the, the question, uh, before the, the outbreak, before the pandemic, I was really optimistic that the student mobility in Southeast Asia will increase because of the economic prosperity in, in the ASEAN region. But right now, as I presented in my, in my PowerPoint, I have a lot of questions particularly as the focus of each country will now be on the reconstruction and recovery. So I am still in doubt that the, uh, the, the mobility programs uh, will be slowing down. That, that's what, what in my thought right now. Thank you. Well, and every roadmap needs to be looking a long way down the road. So let's hope that we get back on track at some point. Um, so just just to finish with yourself, um, uh, Ms. Manusan, if you could just give us a you know either a view on how we might sort of become a force for addressing those inequalities. But I've also seen a couple of questions come in uh, on the live stream about endorsing the AQAF and how that might feature in the roadmap. Um, if you want to touch on either of those as a you know, sort of final thought for this session. Yes, um, yeah, I guess just very quickly, um, it's, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, it, it's very timely, particularly since we are now um, uh, at the stage where we're developing um, the post-2020 uh, work plan for education. So we will, we will really um, look into um, uh, the endorsement and the recognition of, of, the, um, of this framework and um, uh, subsumed under the higher education um, component of um, the ASEAN Work Plan on Education 2021-2025. Brilliant. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you for bearing with the technical di difficulties, which I assume a lot of them, frankly, might have been on my side. You guys have been brilliant. Thank you so much for uh, Joining us, Mr. Kohei, Dr. Choltis, uh, Ms. Manusan, and uh, Darren, we'll be seeing you throughout the week, uh, the coming weeks, I'm sure. Uh, if we can go on to the next slide, uh, just to, so that we can tell you about what is coming up. Thank you, everyone. So tomorrow we, we have our next session uh, following hot on the heels of this one. So innovations in uh, credential recognition and portability, which will be chaired by uh, Mr. Michael um, Honorig. So please, uh, you know, follow the YouTube link there to join us tomorrow. Um, if if we can go to the next slide.
uh, just, so, just as we look further ahead, uh, uh, you'll be able to see details about all of the, the upcoming remaining five uh, webinar sessions. We have sessions on internationalization from home, which I think rings true with a lot of the questions we've been talking about uh, in about inclusion, challenges of virtual mobility, uh, the digital divide will also be addressed in a further session on, on the 23rd of, uh, of June. Uh, I believe we have two more sessions after that on the 24th and 25th of June, if we have those up on the on the presentation as well, uh, you know, where we'll be looking at a, a dialogue on enhancing intra-ASEAN mobility and finally addressing that uh, much discussed question around quality standards and online and distance higher education. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, my thanks again to the panelists uh, for all your inputs today. Uh, uh, Ms. Menes Paltis, Mr. Limada, and uh, Mr. McDermott, you all very much for your time and all your questions. Have a good day. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Bye bye. There is a link to a survey, by the way, so please do fill in the survey as well. <laughs>